Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Chiliteracy. Happy Wednesday and happy November. Um, yes, hello, everybody. I hope we are all well. I do not know why Discord has not done a going live announcement. Uh, it was Discord was playing up yesterday, so um, at least for me and Sam, so it might have something to do with that. Not entirely sure. Um, the pigeon is asleep and our bot is asleep, which is unusual. Um, yeah, Pingu Classics tends to be pretty pretty on time. But, um, yeah, not entirely sure what's going on there. But I guess we'll see if they sort themselves out or not. If not, we'll have to have a look and see what's going on. But, um, but yes... Hello and welcome, everybody. I hope we are all well. How are we all doing? Have we had an all right week so far? All of the, all of the things. Um, I have, what have I done this week? So many things. What have I done this week? I don't even know anymore. I did something on Monday. I can't remember, I did several things on Monday teaching mainly. Uh, yesterday I had a memorial service and then took a choir rehearsal and today I'm doing this. You think work is settling down, Annie Pence? It's been so nuts the last few weeks, few days of normal busy, you feel strange relaxing. Oh well that's good at least that it's settling. Um, yeah. I hope it continues to settle and not be quite so crazy. Um, Pigeon and penguin, the birds are rebelling. They are indeed. Also, hello, Perot. Yes, sorry again to everybody who trickles in after um, realising that there are no Discord notifications for some reason. But bots are being weird. We're not sure why. Um, oh, and I'm sorry to hear that, Llama. That sucks. Um, but yeah, I hope, I hope painkillers are doing what they're meant to do. Um... So, yes. But yes. Hello, Lady Mephistopheles. Hello, Ray Tracer. Hello, Llama. Hello, Andy Pants. Hello, Parola. And Sam, obviously. Uh, and anyone else I've missed. Um, but, um... But, yes. Um... A... PSA for the next couple of weeks. I have not had time this week, sadly, to, um pre-record anything for the next couple of Wednesday streams um, so unless I miraculously manage to record anything tomorrow those streams will either probably not happen or I don't know if Sam has any ideas for some kind of replacement stream or not I don't know so yeah keep keep your ears and eyes peeled on our yeah on the discord and various socials for um, yeah what's going to happen for the next couple of weeks on Wednesdays. Um, Saturdays should be normal. Saturdays should be Sam, I guess, reading whatever he chooses to start reading this Saturday. Um, but I am away for the next two weeks, so um, will not be around to read, um, unfortunately. But, um, but yes, but I am back... This Saturday, you won't be starting a new novel just yet. Oh, okay, so you have to wait for that. Um, but, yeah, so I'm now on the short story train, um, which is fun. Um, no birthday to literacy. Oh, no! Is, are we missing the one that's on your birthday? I'm sorry. Um, we discussed what I'll be doing. Did we? You're not being secretive. Did we? Oh! Yes, of course. Sorry. Yeah, November the 11th. Yes, Sam's going to do... Because this Saturday is November the 11th, Armistice Day. Um, he will, I believe, be reading some uh, basically wartime poetry from a lot of wartime poets. Um, and not in a rah-rah, war is great way. Quite frankly, I don't think there are very many wartime poets who came away from the war with that mentality. So, 
Um, pretty much just planning to read Wilfred Owen for two hours. Yes, indeed. Um, but... Yes, so Zan will be doing that this Saturday. Um, but because he... I have finished... Um, uh, Tale of Two Cities. Um, I am now back on the old short stories. And I have brought out from my bookcase the what's it called the mammoth book of thrillers ghosts and mysteries which is possibly the most like spook it is the most spooky looking book i have it is black and it has a picture of a bat on the front it is wonderful i like it very much so we'll be reading a couple of things from that today um i've only chosen chosen a couple of things because I can't remember how long short stories take because I've been reading Dickens for so flippin' long. Um, and also my voice is a bit eh, because I, I had a lot of singing to do yesterday and a lot of talking over people to do yesterday. Because turns out taking rehearsals is, uh, yeah, you have to talk over people. Has the pigeon beaten Pingu books? Wow. Is our bot just dead? Weird. Hmm. We might have to investigate that. Methinks. Hmm. Interesting. Um. But yeah, so we've got. Let's poke a penguin. Yes. Penguin! Um. Yeah, so today we have some G.K. Chesterton, who I have heard of, and some Geoffrey Farnell, who I have not heard of. Um. But he's a Jeff, so I was like, ooh, automatically a plus. And whilst these aren't necessarily um, uh, ghost stories, I know we're not technically in spooky season anymore, but we here at Literacy do like your odd ghost story, especially at this time of year when the evenings have drawn in and we're all sitting around a fire reading stories together, or at least we wish. Um, we, we do like to, to continue with, with some ghostly tales and things. But um, but yes, these are not necessarily spooky stories. They are they are dark, though, and deal with um, themes like murder, possibly. Um, and, yes, stuff. There is, so the first one, The Hammer of God, there is a um, description of the village idiot, which is, I mean, it's not as bad as it, can be but it does or again it reflects the attitude of the time on people who had disabilities of any kind um using such words as half wit and idiot um so it's not yeah it's not as bad as it could be um it is of course ableist which is not good but um unfortunately there's no way i could read around it really without like just completely ruining the story um and it's not it's not like in a it, it's not in a in a good way necessarily like it's the 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 yeah the people talking about it aren't necessarily good people and you're not meant to like them so i feel like it's couched in that respect because of the characters not necessarily because of the author so um and it's not really, yeah, it's not a particularly particularly long section, so I hope I I hope that's all right with everybody. Um, it's yeah, it's always it's always difficult when these when these topics come up, and I know I mentioned that um, I mentioned it after um, Thingamajig, uh, Tale of Two Cities about Dickens calling uh, the hero of um, Barnaby Rudge uh, an idiot all the time. Um, in the in in what it meant at the time of someone with sort of what well, someone with some kind of learning difficulties or or some kind of disability which is not great but also there was not anywhere near enough understanding back then um and obviously we have improved as a world thank goodness so uh yeah just a heads up on that one um, but hello, Sir Rimbold. Rimbold? 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 I don't know. But welcome in. Lovely to see you here. I see, as Sam has said, you are, uh, you have, um, come to us from Billiam's chat, which is lovely. We do like Billiam. Um, and 
all of the things he does and his delightful community. So welcome in and make yourself comfortable. So, uh, yeah. It's a French poet. It is. I knew that. <laughs> I just didn't know whether that was how one, one pronounces. Oh, we're doing a shout out for Billiam. Let's do it. I will, I will let you do it. Hey. Hurrah. But, um, but yes, I'm going to take a sip of water. Because my voice is getting a bit croaky. And, ooh, and I'm going to hit the microphone whilst I open the book. Great. Also fantastic. And the problem with G... The problem with G.K. Chesterton... No, the problem with me reading G.K. Chesterton, Chesterton is unfortunately I can't hear or read his name without thinking of the wonderful P.G. Woodhouse quote of The stillness of the summer evening was broken by what sounded like G.K. Chesterton falling on a sheet of tin. Thank you, Woodhouse, for ruining that name for me. Go read Season in Hell. It's interesting for on how unhinged the writing is. Excellent. Okay. Putting that on my to-read list. But yes, um, if everybody is sitting comfortably, if everybody has some kind of warm beverage, because the nights are indeed drawing in. It is getting cold. I have cracked out the turtlenecks. Not right now, but it is officially jumper season. Um, or sweater season if you're American. <sighs> Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, let us begin. It's like 80 degrees. Well, shh. Stupid temperatures. Um, <laughs> it's getting dark and it's 420. Yep. So, if we're all comfortable, if we're all cosy, if we're all ready to be, not really spooked, I guess, but, I don't know, scared maybe? I'm not sure. 27 non-freedom units. Wow. Savage. Okay. I will stop interrupting us interrupting myself. I blame you, chat. We will begin with The Hammer of God by G. K. Chesterton. The little village of Bohun Beacon was perched on a hill so steep that the tall spire of its church seemed only like the peak of a small mountain. At the foot of the church stood a smithy, generally red with fires and always littered with hammers and scraps of iron. Opposite to this, over a rude cross of cobbled paths, was the Blue Boar, the only inn of the place. It was upon this crossway, in the lifting of a leaden and silver daybreak, that two brothers met in the street and spoke, though one was beginning the day and the other finishing it. The Reverend and Honourable Wilfred Bowen was very devout and was making his way to some austere exercises of prayer or contemplation at dawn. Colonel the Honourable Norman Bohun, his elder brother, was by no means devout and was sitting in evening, evening dress on the bench outside the Blue Boar, drinking what the philosophic observer was free to regard either as his last glass on Tuesday or his first on Wednesday. The Colonel was not particular. The Bohuns were one of the very few aristocratic families really dating from the Middle Ages, and their pennon had actually seen Palestine. But it is a great mistake to suppose that such houses stand high in chivalric tradition. Few except the poor preserve traditions. Aristocrats live not in traditions, but in fashions. The Bohans had been Mohawks under Queen Anne and Mashers under Queen Victoria. But like more than one of the really ancient houses, they had rotted in the last two centuries into mere drunkards and dandy degenerates, till there had even come a whisper of insanity. Certainly there was something hardly human about the Colonel's wolfish pursuit of pleasure and his chronic resolution not to go home till morning had a touch of the hideous clarity of insomnia. He was a tall, fine animal, elderly, but with hair still startlingly yellow. He would have looked merely blonde and leonine, but his blue eyes were sunk so deep in his face that they looked black. 
they were a little too close together. He had very long yellow moustaches, on each side of them a fold or furrow from nostril to jaw, so that a sneer seemed cut into his face. Over his evening clothes he wore a curious pale yellow coat that looked more like a very light dressing gown than an overcoat, and on the back of his head was stuck an extraordinary broad-brimmed hat of a bright green colour, evidently some oriental curiosity caught up at random. He was proud of appearing in such incongruous attires, proud of the fact that he always made them look congruous. His brother the curate had also the yellow hair and the elegance, but he was buttoned up to the chin in black, and his face was clean-shaven, cultivated, and a little nervous. He seemed to live for nothing but his religion, but there were some who said, notably the blacksmith, who was a Presbyterian, that it was a love of Gothic architecture rather than of God, and that his haunting of the church like a ghost was only another and purer turn of the almost morbid thirst for beauty which sent his brother raging after women and wine. This charge was doubtful, while the man's practical piety was indubitable. Indeed, the charge was mostly an ignorant misunderstanding of the love of solitude and secret prayer, and was founded on his being often found kneeling, not before the altar, but in peculiar places, in the crypts, or gallery, or even in the belfry. He was, at the moment, about to enter the church through the yard of the smithy, but stopped and frowned a little as he saw his brother's cavernous eyes staring in the same direction. On the hypothesis that the colonel was interested in the church, he did not waste any speculations. There only remained the blacksmith's shop, and though the blacksmith was a Puritan and none of his people, Wilfred Bohan had heard some scandals about a beautiful and rather celebrated wife. He flung a suspicious look across the shed, and the colonel stood up laughing to speak to him. "'Good morning, Wilfred,' he said. Like a good landlord, I am watching sleeplessly over my people. I am going to call on the blacksmith. Wilfred looked at the ground and said, The blacksmith is out. He is over at Greenford. I know, answered the other with silent laughter. That is why I am calling on him. Norman, said the cleric, with his eye on a pebble in the road, are you ever afraid of thunderbolts? <laughs> what do you mean? asked the colonel. Is your hobby meteorology? I mean, said Wilfred, without looking up, do you ever think that God might strike you in the street? I beg your pardon, said the colonel. I see your hobby is folklore. I know your hobby is blasphemy retorted the religious man, stung in the one live place of his nature. But if you do not fear God, you have good reason to fear man. The elder raised his eyebrows politely. Fear man, he said. Barnes the blacksmith is the biggest and strongest man for forty miles round, said the clergyman sternly. I know you are no coward or weakling, but he could throw you over the wall. This struck home, being true, and the lowering line by mouth and nostril darkened and deepened. For a moment he stood with the heavy sneer on his face. But in an instant Colonel Bohun had recovered his own cruel good humour and laughed, showing two dog-like front teeth under his yellow moustache. "'In that case, my dear Wilfred,' he said quite carelessly, it was wise for the last of the Bohans to come out partially in armour. And he took off the queer round hat covered with green, showing that it was lined within with steel. Wilfred recognised it indeed as a light Japanese or Chinese helmet torn down from a trophy that hung in the old family hall. It was the first hat to hand, explained his brother airily. Always the nearest hat and the nearest woman. 
The blacksmith is away at Greenford, said Wilfred quietly. The time of his return is unsettled. And with that, he turned and went into the church with bowed head, crossing himself like one who wishes to be quit of an unclean spirit. He was anxious to forget such grossness in the cool twilight of his tall Gothic cloisters, but on that morning it was fated that his still round of religious exercises should be everywhere arrested by small shocks. As he entered the church, hitherto always empty at that hour, a kneeling figure rose hastily to its feet and came towards the full daylight of the doorway. When the curate saw it, he stood still with surprise. For the early worshipper was none other than the village idiot, a nephew of the blacksmith, one who neither would nor could care for the church or for anything else. He was always called Mad Joe and seemed to have no other name. He was a dark, strong, slouching lad, with a heavy white face, dark, straight hair, and a mouth always open. As he passed the priest, his moon-calf countenance gave no hint of what he had been doing or thinking of. He had never been known to pray before. What sort of prayers was he saying now? Extraordinary prayers, surely. Wilfred Bohan stood rooted to the spot, long enough to see the idiot go out into the sunshine, and even to see his dissolute brother hail him with a sort of avuncular jocularity. The last thing he saw was the colonel throwing pennies at the open mouth of Joe, with a serious appearance of trying to hit it. This ugly sunlight picture of the stupidity and cruelty of the earth sent the ascetic finally to his prayers for purification and new thoughts. He went up to a pew in the gallery, which brought him under a coloured window which he loved and always quieted his spirit. A blue window with an angel carrying lilies. There he began le to think less about the half-wit, with his livid face and mouth like a fish, he began to think less of his evil brother, pacing like a lean lion in his horrible hunger. He sank deeper and deeper into those cold and sweet colours of silver blossoms and sapphire sky. In this place, half an hour afterwards, he was found by Gibbs, the village cobbler, who had been sent for him in some haste. He got to his feet with promptitude, for he knew that no small matter would have brought Gibbs into such a place at all. The cobbler was, as in many villages, an atheist, and his appearance in church was a shade more extraordinary than Mad Joe's. It was a morning of theological enigmas. "'What is it?' asked Wilfred Bohan rather stiffly, but putting out a trembling hand for his hat. The atheist spoke in a tone that, coming from him, was quite startlingly respectful, and even, as it were, huskily sympathetic. "'You must excuse me, sir,' he said in a hoarse whisper, "'but we didn't think it right not to let you know at once. "'I'm afraid a rather dreadful thing has happened, sir. "'I'm afraid your brother—' Wilfred clenched his frail hands. "'What devilry has he done now?' he cried in involuntary passion. Oh, "'Why, sir?' said the cobbler, coughing. "'I'm afraid he's done nothing, and won't do anything. "'I'm afraid he's done for. "'You had really better come down, sir.' The curate followed the cobbler down a short, winding stair, which brought them out at an entrance rather higher than the street. Bohan saw the tragedy in one glance, flat underneath him like a plan. In the yard of the smithy were standing five or six men, mostly in black, one in an inspector's uniform. They included the doctor, the Presbyterian minister, and the priest from the Roman Catholic chapel, to which the blacksmith's wife belonged. The latter was speaking to her, indeed, very rapidly, in an undertone, as she, a magnificent woman with red-gold hair, was sobbing bright blindly on a bench. Between these two groups, and just clear of the main heap of hammers, lay a man in evening dress, spread-eagled and flat on his face. 
From the height above Wilfred, uh, from the height above, Wilfred could have sworn to every item of his costume and appearance, down to the bohun rings upon his fingers. But the skull was only a hideous splash, like a star of blackness and blood. Wilfred Bohun gave but one glance and ran down the steps into the yard. The doctor, who was the family physician, saluted him, but he scarcely took any notice. He could only stammer out, My brother is dead. What does it mean? What is this horrible mystery? There was an unhappy silence, and then the cobbler, the most outspoken man present, answered, Plenty of horror, sir, he said, but not much mystery. What do you mean? asked Wilfred with a white face. It's plain enough, answered Gibbs. There is only one man for forty miles round that could have struck such a blow as that, and he's the man that had most reason to. We must not prejudge anything, put in the doctor, a tall black-bearded man, rather nervously, but it is competent for me to corroborate what Mr Gibbs says about the nature of the blow, sir. It is an incredible blow. Mr Gibbs says that only one man in this district could have done it. I should have said myself that nobody could have done it. A shudder of superstition went through the slight figure of the curate. I can hardly understand, he said. Mr Bohun, said the doctor in a low voice, metaphors literally fail me. It is inadequate to say that the skull was smashed to bits like an eggshell. Fragments of bone were driven into the body and the ground like bullets into a mud wall. It was the hand of a giant. He was silent a moment, looking grimly through his glasses. Then he added, The thing has one advantage, that it clears most people of suspicion at one stroke. If you or I or any normally made man in the country were accused of this crime, we should be acquitted as an infant would be acquitted of stealing the Nelson column. That's what I say, repeated the cobbler obstinately. There's only one man that could have done it, and he's the man that would have done it. Where's Simeon Barnes, the blacksmith? He, he's over at Greenford, faltered the curate. More likely over in France muttered the cobbler. No, he is in neither of those places, said a small and colourless voice, which came from the little, the little Roman priest who had joined the group. As a matter of fact, he is coming up the road at this moment. The little priest was not an interesting man to look at, having stubbly brown hair and a round and stolid face. But... If he had been as splendid as Apollo, no one would have looked at him at that moment. Everyone turned round and peered at the pathway which wound across the plain below, along which was indeed walking, at his own huge stride and with a hammer on his shoulder, Simeon the smith. He was a bony and gigantic man, with deep, dark, sinister eyes and a dark chin beard. He was walking and talking quietly with two other men, and though he was never specially cheerful, he seemed quite at his ease. "'My God!' cried the atheistic cobbler. "'And there's the hammer he did it with!' "'No,' said the inspector, a sensible-looking man with a sandy moustache, speaking for the first time. "'There's the hammer he did it with over there by the church wall. We have left it and the body exactly as they are.' All glanced round, and the short priest went across and looked down in silence at the tool where it lay. It was one of the smallest and the lightest of the hammers, and would not have caught the eye among the rest, but on the iron edge of it were blood and yellow hair. After a silence, the short priest spoke without looking up, and there was a new note in his dull voice. Mr. Gibbs was hardly right, he said, in saying that there is no mystery. There is at least the mystery of why so big a man should attempt so big a blow with so little a hammer. Oh, never mind that, cried Gibbs in a fever. What are we to do with Simeon Barnes? 
Leave him alone, said the priest quietly. He is coming here of himself. I know those two men with him. They are very good fellows from Greenford, and they have come over about the Presbyterian chapel. Even as he spoke, the tall smith swung round the corner of the church and strode into his own yard. Then he stood there quite still, and the hammer fell from his hand. The inspector, who had preserved impenetrable propriety, immediately went up to him. "'I won't ask you, Mr Barnes,' he said, "'whether you know anything about what has happened here. "'You are not bound to say. "'I hope you don't know and that you will be able to prove it. "'But I must go through the form of arresting you in the King's name "'for the murder of Colonel Norman Bohun.' "'You are not bound to say anything,' said the cobbler in officious excitement. "'They've got to prove everything. "'They haven't proved yet that it is Colonel Bohun with the head all smashed up like that.' "'That won't wash,' said the doctor aside to the priest. "'That's out of the detective stories. "'I was the colonel's medical man, and I knew his body better than he did. "'He had very fine hands, but quite peculiar ones. "'The second and third fingers were the same in length.' Oh, that's the colonel right enough. As he glanced at the brained corpse upon the ground, the iron eyes of the motionless blacksmith followed them and rested there also. Is Colonel Bohun dead? said the smith quite calmly. Then he's damned. Don't say anything, oh, don't say anything, cried the atheist cobbler, dancing about in an ecstasy of admiration of the English legal system for no man is such a legalist as the good secularist. The blacksmith turned on him over his shoulder as the august face of a fanatic. It's well for you infidels to dodge like foxes because the world's law favours you, he said, but God guards his own in his pocket, as you shall see this day. Then he pointed to the colonel and said, When did this dog die in his sins? Moderate your language, said the doctor. Moderate the Bible's language and I'll moderate mine. When did he die? I, I, I saw him alive at six o'clock this morning, stammered Wilfred Bohun. God is good, said the smith. Mr Inspector, I have not the slightest objection to being arrested. It is you who may object to arresting me. I don't mind leaving the court without a stain on my character. You do mind, perhaps, leaving the court with a bad setback in your career. The solid inspector, for the first time, looked at the blacksmith with a lively eye, as did everybody else, except the short, strange priest, who was still looking down at the little hammer that had dealt the dreadful blow. There are two men standing outside this shop, went on the blacksmith with ponderous lucid lucidity, Good tradesmen in Greenford, whom you all know, who will swear that they saw me from before midnight till daybreak and long after in the committee room of our revival mission, which sits all night we save souls so fast. In Greenford itself, twenty people could swear to me for all that time. If I were a heathen, Mr. Inspector, I would let you walk on to your downfall. But as a Christian man, I feel bound to give, give you your chance and ask whether you will hear my alibi now or in court. The inspector seemed for the first time disturbed, and said, Of course I should be glad to clear you altogether now. The smith walked out of his yard with the same long and easy stride, and returned to his two friends from Greenford, who were indeed friends of nearly everyone present. Each of them said a few words which no one ever thought of disbelieving. When they had spoken, the innocence of Simeon stood up as solid as the great church above them. One of those silences struck the group which are more strange and insufferable than any speech. Madly, in order to make conversation, the curate said to the Catholic priest, eh, You seem very much interested in that hammer, Father Brown. Yes, I am, said Father Brown. Why is it such a small hammer? The doctor swung round on him. By George, that's true, he cried. 
who would use a little hammer with ten larger hammers lying about? Then he lowered his voice in the curate's ear and said, Only the kind of person that can't lift a large hammer. It is not a question of force or courage between the sexes. It's a question of lifting power in the shoulders. A bold woman could commit ten murders with a light hammer and never turn a hair. She could not kill a beetle with a heavy one. Wilfred Bohan was staring at him with a sort of hypnotised horror, while Father Brown listened with his head a little on one side, really interested and attentive. The doctor went on with more hissing emphasis. Why do these idiots always assume that the only person who hates the wife's lover is the wife's husband? Nine times out of ten, the person who most hates the wife's lover is the wife. Who knows what insolence or treachery she had, uh, he had shown her? Look here, look there. He made a momentary gesture towards the red-haired woman on the bench. She had lifted her head at last, and the tears were drying on her splendid face. But the eyes were fixed on the corpse with an electric glare that had in it something of idiocy. The Reverend Wilfred Bohan made a limp gesture as if waving away all desire to know, but Father Brown, dusting off his sleeve some ashes blown from the furnace, spoke in his indifferent way. You are like so many doctors, he said. Your mental science is really suggestive. It is your physical science that is, ut that is utterly impossible. I agree that the woman wants to kill the co-res co-respondent much more than the petitioner does. And I agree that a woman will always pick up a small hammer instead of a big one. But the difficulty is one of physical impossibility. No woman ever born could have smashed a man's skull out flat like that. Then he added reflectively, after a pause, These people haven't grasped the whole of it. The man was actually wearing an iron helmet, and the blow scattered it like broken glass. Look at that woman. Look at her arms. Silence held them all up again, and then the doctor said rather sulkily, Well, I may be wrong. There are objections to everything. But I stick to the main point. No man but an idiot would pick up that little hammer if he could use a big hammer. With that, the lean and quivering hands of Wilfred Bohun went up to his head and seemed to clutch his scanty yellow hair. After an instant, they dropped, and he cried, That was the word I wanted! You have said the word! Then he continued, mastering his discomposure, the words you said were, no man but an idiot would pick up the small hammer. Yes, said the doctor. Well? Well, said the curate, no man but an idiot did. The rest stared at him with eyes arrested and riveted, and he went on in a febrile and feminine agitation. I am a priest, he cried unsteadily, and, and a priest should be no shedder of blood. I, I mean that he should bring no one to the gallows. And I thank God that I see the criminal clearly now, because he is a criminal who, who cannot be brought to the gallows. You will not denounce him, inquired the doctor. He would not be hanged if I did denounce him, answered Wilfred with a wild but curiously happy smile. When I went into the church this morning, I found a madman play praying there, that poor Joe, who has been wrong all his life. God knows what he prayed, but with such strange folk it is not incredible to suppose that their prayers are all upside down. Very likely a lunatic would pray before killing a man. When I last saw poor Joe, he was with my brother. My brother was mocking him. By Jove, cried the doctor, this is talking at last. But how do you explain... The Reverend Wilfred was almost trembling with the excitement of his own glimpse of the truth. Don't you see? Don't you see? He cried feverishly. That is the only theory that covers both the queer things, that answers both the riddles. The two riddles are the little hammer and the big blow. The smith might have struck the big blow, but would not have chosen the little hammer. His wife would have chosen the little hammer, but she could not have struck the big blow. But the madman might have done both. As for the little hammer, why, he was mad and he might have picked up anything. 
And, and for the big blow, have you never heard, Doctor, that a maniac in his paroxysm may have the strength of ten men? The Doctor drew a deep breath and then said, By golly, I believe you've got it. Father Brown had fixed his eyes on the speaker so long and steadily as to prove that his large, grey, ox-like eyes were not quite so insignificant as the rest of his face. When silence had fallen, he said with marked respect, Mr Bohan, yours is the only theory yet propounded which holds water every way and is essentially unassailable. I think, therefore, that you deserve to be told on my positive knowledge, that it is not the true one. And with that, the odd little man walked away and stared again at the hammer. That fellow seems to know more than he ought to, whispered the doctor peevishly to Wilfred. Those popish priests are deucedly sly. No, no, said Bohun with a sort of wild fatigue, it was the lunatic! It was the lunatic! The group of the two clerics and the doctor had fallen away from the more official group containing the inspector and the man he had arrested. Now, however, that their own party had broken up, they heard voices from the others. The priest looked up quietly and then looked down again as he heard the blacksmith say in a loud voice, I hope I've convinced you, Mr Inspector. I'm a strong man, as you say, but I couldn't have flung my hammer bang here from Greenford. My hammer hasn't any wings that it should come flying half a mile over hedges and fields. The inspector laughed amicably and said, No, I think you can be considered out of it, though it's one of the rummiest coincidences I ever saw. I can only ask you to give us all the assistance you can in finding a man as big and strong as yourself. By George, you might be useful if only to hold him. I suppose... You yourself have no guess at the man. I may have a guess, said the pale smith, but it is not at a man. Then, seeing the scared eyes turned towards his wife on the bench, he put his huge hand on her shoulder and said, Nor a woman either. What do you mean? asked the inspector jocularly. You don't think cows use hammers, do you? I think no thing of flesh held that hammer, said the blacksmith in a stifled voice. Mortally speaking, I think the man died alone. Wilfred made a sudden forward movement and peered at him with burning eyes. Do you mean to say, Barnes, came the sharp voice of the cobbler, that the hammer jumped up of itself and, itself and knocked the man down? Oh, you gentlemen may stare and snigger, cried Simeon. You clergymen who tell us on Sunday in what a stillness the Lord smote Sennacherib. I believe that one who walks invisible in every house defended the honour of mine and laid the defiler dead before the door of it. I believe the force in that blow was just the force there is in earthquakes and no force less. Wilfred said, with a voice utterly undescribable. I told Norman myself to beware of the thunderbolt. That agent is outside my jurisdiction, said the inspector with a slight smile. You are not outside his, answered the smith. See you to it. And turning his broad back, he went into the house. The shaken Wilfred was led away by Father Brown, who had an easy and friendly way with him. Let us get out of this horrid place, Mr Bohun, he said. May I look inside your church? I hear it's one of the oldest in England. We take some interest, you know, he added with a comical grimace, in old English churches. Wilfred Bohun did not smile, for humour was never his strong point. But he nodded rather eagerly, being only too ready to explain the Gothic splendours to someone more likely to be sympathetic than the Presbyterian blacksmith or the atheist cobbler. "'By all means,' he said, "'let us go in at this side.' And he led the way into the high side entrance at the top of the flight of steps. 
Father Brown was mounting the first step to follow him when he felt a hand on his shoulder and turned to behold the dark, thin figure of the doctor, his face darker yet with suspicion. Sir, said the physician harshly, you appear to know some secrets in this black business. May I ask if you are going to keep them to yourself? Why, doctor, answered the priest, smiling quite pleasantly. There is one very good reason why a man of my trade should keep things to himself when he is not sure of them, and that is that it is so constantly his duty to keep them to himself when he is sure of them. But if you think I have been discourteously reticent with you or anyone, I will go to the extreme limit of my custom. I will give you two very large hints. Well, sir, said the doctor gloomily. First, said Father Brown quietly, the thing is quite in your own province. It is a matter of physical science. The blacksmith is mistaken, not perhaps in saying that the blow was divine, but certainly in saying that it came by a miracle. It was no miracle, Doctor, except in so far as man is himself a miracle, with his strange and wicked and yet half-heroic heart. The force that smashed that skull was a force, force well known to scientists, one of the most frequently debated of the laws of nature. The doctor, who was looking at him with frowning intentness, only said, And the other hint? The other hint is this, said the priest. Do you remember the blacksmith, though he believes in miracles, talking scornfully of the impossible fairy tale that his hammer had wings and flew half a mile across country? Yes, said the doctor. I remember that. Well, added Father Brown with a broad smile, that fairy tale was the nearest thing to the real truth that has been said today. And with that he turned his back and stumped up the steps after the curate. The Reverend Wilfred, who had been waiting for him, pale and impatient, as if this little delay were the last straw for his nerves, led him immediately to his favourite corner of the church, that part of the gallery closest to the carved roof and lit by the wonderful window with the angel. The little Latin priest explored and admired everything exhaustively, talking cheerfully but in a low voice all the time. When, in the course of his investigation, he found the side exit and the winding stair down which Wilfred had rushed to find his brother dead, Father Brown ran not down, but up, with the agility of a monkey, and his clear voice came from an outer platform above. "'Come up here, Mr. Bohun,' he called. "'The air will do you good.' Bohun followed him and came out on a kind of stone gallery or balcony outside the building, from which one could see the illimitable plain in which their small hill stood, wooded away to the purple horizon and dotted with villages and farms. Clear and square, but quite small beneath them, was the blacksmith's yard, where the inspector still stood taking notes, and the corpse still lay like a smashed fly might be the map of the world, mightn't it? said Father Brown. Yes, said Bohun very gravely, and nodded his head. Immediately beneath and about them, the lines of the Gothic building plunged outwards into the void with a sickening swiftness akin to suicide. There is that element of titan energy in the architecture of the Middle Ages that, from whatever aspect it be seen, it always seems to be rushing away like the strong back of some maddened horse. This church was hewn out of ancient and silent stone, bearded with old fungoids and stained with the nests of birds. And yet, when they saw it from below, it sprang like a fountain at the stars, and when they saw it as now from above, it poured like a cataract into a voiceless pit. For these two men on the tower were left alone with the most terrible aspect of the Gothic, 
the monstrous foreshortening and disproportion, the dizzy perspectives, the glimpses of great things small and small things great, a topsy-turvydom of stone in the mid-air. Details of stone, enormous by their proximity, were relieved against a, ma a pattern of fields and farms, pygmy in their distance. A carved bird or beast at a corner seemed like some vast walking or flying dragon wasting the pastures and villages below. The whole atmosphere was dizzy and dangerous, as if men were upheld in air amid the gyrating wings of colossal genii, and the whole of that old church, as tall and rich as a cathedral, seemed to sit upon the sunlit country like a cloudburst. I think there is something rather dangerous about standing on these high places even to pray, said Father Brown. Heights were made to be looked at, not to be looked from. Do you mean that one may fall over? asked Wilfred. I mean that one's soul may fall if one's body doesn't, said the other priest. I scarcely understand you, remarked Bohun indistinctly. Look at that blacksmith, for instance, went on Father Brown calmly. A good man, but not a Christian. Hard, imperious, unforgiving. Well, his Scotch religion was made up by men who prayed on hills and high crags and learnt to look down on the world more than to look up at heaven. Humility is the mother of giants. One sees great things from the valley, only small things from the peak. But he... he didn't do it, said Bohun tremulously. No, said the other in an odd voice. We know he didn't do it. After a moment, he resumed, looking tranquilly out over the plain with his pale grey eyes. I knew a man, he said, who began by worshipping with others before the altar, but who grew fond of high and lonely places to pray from, corners or niches in the belfry or the spire, and once, in one of those dizzy places, where the whole world seemed to turn under him like a wheel, his brain turned also, and he fancied he was God. So that though he was a good man, he committed a great crime. Wilfred's face was turned away, but his bony hands turned blue and white as they tightened on the parapet of stone. He thought it was given to him to judge the world and strike down a sinner. He would never have had such a thought if he had been kneeling with the other men upon a floor. But he saw all men walking about like insects. He saw one especially strutting just below him, insolent and evident by a bright green hat, a poisonous insect. Rooks cawed round the corners of the belfry, but there was no other sound till Father Brown went on. This also tempted him that he had in his hand one of the most awful engines of nature, I mean gravitation, that mad and quickening rush by which all Earth's creatures fly back to her heart when released. See, the inspector is strutting just below us in the smithy. If I were to toss a pebble over this parapet, it would be something, excuse me, it would be something like a bullet by the time it struck him. If I were to drop a hammer, even a small hammer. Wilfred Bohun threw one leg over the parapet, and Father Brown had him in a minute by the collar. Not by that door, he said quite gently. That door leads to hell. Bohun staggered back against the wall and stared at him with frightful eyes. How, how do you know all this? he cried. Are you a devil? I am a man, answered Father Brown gravely, and therefore have all devils in my heart. Listen to me, he said after a short pause. I know what you did. At least I can guess the great part of it. 
When you left your brother, you were racked with no, un no unrighteous rage to the extent even that you snatched up a small hammer, half inclined to kill him with his foulness on his mouth. Recoiling, you thrust it under your buttoned coat instead and rushed into the church. You pray wildly in many places, under the angel window, upon the platform above, and on a higher platform still, from which you could see the colonel's eastern hat like the back of a green beetle crawling about. Then something snapped in your soul, and you let God's thunderbolt fall. Wilfred put a weak hand to his head and asked in a low voice, how did you know that his hat looked like a green beetle? Oh, that, said the other with the shadow of a smile, that was common sense. But hear me further. I say I know all this, but no one else shall know it. The next step is for you. I shall take no more steps. I will seal this with the seal of confession. If you ask me why, there are many reasons and only one that concerns you. I leave things to you because you have not yet gone very far wrong as assassins go. You did not help to fix the crime on the smith when it was easy or on his wife when that was easy. You tried to fix it on the imbecile because you knew that he could not suffer. That was one of the gleams that it is my business to find in assassins. And now come down into the village and go your own way as free as the wind, for I have said my last word. They went down the winding stairs in utter silence and came out in the, into the sunlight by the smithy. Wilfred Bohan carefully unlatched the wooden gate of the yard and going up to the inspector said, I wish to give myself up. I have killed my brother. The end. I hope you enjoyed. I quite like how twisty that one is, and I quite like the fact that the guy who was so willing to pin a crime uh, on someone who absolutely had nothing to do with it, um, just because it was like, oh, well, he's an idiot, therefore it's fine. It's like, no, 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 no. Um, so, um... Yes, I'm glad that he got his comeuppance. So many circle, Jesus. Yeah, I know, right? Um, it, yes, it was not the disabled man. Thank goodness. Um, and the the guy who was being all judgmental about him kind of got his comeuppance. So, woo. Well, I mean, both guys did, really. The one who was actually assaulting him with money. Well, was it money or stones? Whatever he was throwing at him. But um, this is the first episode of the TV series Father Brown, isn't it? Or what was turned into that? Yes, Father Brown is a G.K. Chesterton thing. Um, a bit like, uh, is it Blackwood who's got um, Karnaki um, and Thingy Silence? Is that Blackwood as well? If Sam's there? Can't remember. But um, yeah, apparently every author's got to... Blackwood is Silence. Who's Karnaki? Oh, um, Thingy. What's his face? Um, Hope Hodgson. Yes? Yes, Hope Hodgson. Um, yeah, apparently every author who likes writing sort of dark stuff has got to have a detective. Basically, everybody wants Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Today you learn standing on, standing on top of tall buildings leads to murder. Yes, I don't know if anybody else had the same thought that I did with this whole story. It's, oh, oh, it's, uh, it's hot fuzz. <laughs> it's hot fuzz. It's, it's the bit where the church falls on someone. Well, falls gets pushed so uh yes um but i hope you enjoyed that one um i thought that was quite fun uh, today you learn cobblers are atheists and therefore like justice i know right i like the fact that um oh you hate that bit sam yeah i don't like that bit either um you didn't finish the episode for some reason but it was thinking you felt like but yeah 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 it's a bit hot fuzz there we go i'm not the only one um Yes, I did like the fact that the only descriptor we have for the cobbler is that he's an atheist. The atheist cobbler. I was like, all right, all right. Um, yes, and slightly racist to the Scots as well. The greater good. But anyway, 
I will I will take us to a break. Um, so go do break related things, and we will see you back in about five minutes for another story. Goodbye for now. <laughs>
And we return. Welcome back, everybody. I hope we've had a nice break. I hope you've done all the break-related things you wanted to do. Um, I hope you've had a fulfilling break. I don't know. I don't know what I'm all about. Um, woke cobblers. I know, right? Should probably give the show Father Brown another go. I didn't even know it was a TV show. Um, I've I know of Father Brown as a as a thing. I didn't realise there was a TV show about it. So um, yeah. Um, everybody's got to have. It's been like, oh god, isn't there another, another? Is there another priest, detective figure? In some fiction, I feel like there is. I don't know. But yes, I hope we're all doing well. You did your usual snail watching during break. Snails are currently snailing. Well, I'm glad they're snailing. That's that is after all what snails do. Mr. Weasley. Oh, does he? Oh, god, it's awful, isn't it? Can't remember his actual name. Ha! Huh, that's cool though. Didn't know that. Um. Oh, but um. Oh, I should get a link to the text for this one. Da -ba -da -ba -da. If I can. Uh. Are you a are you a site that I can no? No, you are not. I bet someone's going to beat me to it. Mark Williams, that's the one. Sorry, I probably clicked very loudly into the microphone there. Um, let's see if I can find it. Find it. Find it. Find it. Um, apologies, everybody. I am bad at this. Oh yes, all of your snails, all of Llama's snails are named after Charles Dickens' characters, which is excellent. Um, absolutely fantastic. Can I, can I not click on this thing? Can I, can I have a story please, everybody? Huh. Apparently... Apparently, I, I, there isn't, there doesn't seem to be a copy of it on Project Gutenberg, which is annoying. Um, is this one? No. Yes, there's a lot of. Um, do you have it? Sorry, everybody. No. <laughs> How very rude. Um, I can't seem to find the text of this. Apologies, everybody. There's lots of sort of it's around, but um, yes, annoyingly, I can't seem to find um, text for it. The Cupboard is the story by Geoffrey Farnall. Um, it's in the in the stream description. Um, yeah, if anyone can find it, that would be fab. If not, no worries. Um, but I think this is possi it's possibly a little bit longer. Um, so I will get started if we're all sitting comfortably and things. Then uh, this wonderfully titled story. Excuse me. Oh, you're the yawn. We shall begin. The Cupboard by Geoffrey Farnell Among all the tenants of Clifford's Inn, none was more highly esteemed than Mr John Jarvey, attorney at law. His clients, as the case might be, confided their woes to him unreservedly, depended with boundless faith upon his astuteness to extricate them from their difficulties, and respected him, each and all, for his eminent and approved worth. As for Mr Jarvey himself, tall and neat of person, kindly and unobtrusive of manner, he seemed to radiate a mild benevolence from the crisp curls of his precise wig to the broad buckles of his trim shoes. 
In a word, Mr Jarvie was all that a highly respected attorney at law could possibly attain to, unto. Even Job, the gate porter, whose salutations were in exact ratio to his estimation of the standing and condition of the various residents, would lift knobby fingers to the brim of his hat with a gesture slow and unspeakably respectful, while Tom, the bedmaker, a cheery soul, given alternately to whistling, whistling and sucking at a noxious clay pipe, checked the one and left the other outside when duty summoned him within the top floor chambers of number 10, which was Mr Jarvie's abode. And Christopher, the bootblack, who plied his trade within the shadow of Temple Bar, with Mr Jarvie's leg before him and Mr Jarvie's comfortable, kindly voice in his ears, scrubbed and rubbed with a gusto to lend worthy Mr Jarvie's shoes and added sheen. Such, then, was Mr John Jarvie, attorney at law of number 10 Clifford's Inn. Now, it was upon a certain blusterous and rainy December night towards eleven of the clock that Job, the gate porter, nodding comfortably over the fire within his lodge, was aroused by a loud and imperious rapping on the outer door. Sighing, Job sat up, and having paused a while to blink at the cosy fire and murmur a plaintive curse or so upon his disturber, got slowly to his feet as the summons was repeated, and, stepping forth of his lodge, proceeded to draw bolt and bar and open the gate. A tall figure, in a long, rain-sodden, many-caped riding coat and wide-eaved hat, this much he saw by aid of the dim lamp that flickered in the fitful wind gusts. "'Mr John Jarvie?' inquired a hoarse voice, though somewhat indistinct by reason of upturned coat collar and voluminous, voluminous muffler. "'Oh?' demanded Job aggressively and squaring his elbows. The stranger raised a large hand to loosen the shawl about his mouth and chin, and Job noticed a small, plain gold ring that gleamed upon the little finger of this hand. "'I said Mr John Jarvie. He lives here still?' "'Surely,' nodded Job. Five and twenty year to my knowing. "'But if you be come on business, you be over late.' Mr Jarvie never sees nobody after six o'clock, no how. Never did, never will. Makes it a rule, he do. And he lives here, at number ten, I think. Aye, number ten. Top floor as ever was. But if you become if you become on business, it aren't no matter of good you. Lord love me. Gasped Job as sorry, Lord love me, gasped Job, as swept aside by a long arm, he staggered and watched the tall figure flit past and vanish in the swirling, gusty darkness of the inn. For a moment Job meditated pursuit, but thinking better of it, shook his head and proceeded to bolt and bar the gate. By Joes, said he, addressing the gusty dark. Of all the body-snatching rascal rogues, yon's the body-snatchingest. Burn him in and outers. With which malediction, Job got back to fire and armchair and promptly fell a-dozing like the watchman he was. Meantime, the stranger, with head bowed to the lashing rain, slipped and stumbled over the uneven, uneven pavement, blundered into iron railings, fell foul of unsuspected corners, and, often pausing to peer about him in the gloom, found his way at last to the dim-lit doorway of number 10, and stood to read, among diverse others, the name of John Jarvie, attorney at law. He seemed to find some subtle fascination in the name, for he stood there with the rain running off him while he read it over and over again, speaking the words to himself in a soft, sibilant whisper, suggestive of clenched teeth. John Jarvie, attorney at law. While his hands, buried in the deep side pockets of his coat hitherto, began to fumble with the muffler that swathed throat and chin, to loosen the buttons of his caped coat, and his right hand, gliding into his breast, seemed to touch and caress something that lay hidden there. Thus stood he, peering from the shadow of his hat and whispering to himself so long that the rain, 
dripping from his garments, formed small, evil-looking pools on the dingy floor. Suddenly he turned, and, with left hand outstretched and groping in the air before him and right hand hidden in his bosom, he began to climb the dark stair. He mounted slowly and very softly, and so at last reached the topmost landing, where burned a lantern whose feeble light showed a door whereon was painted the name Mr. John Jarvey. Clenching his fist, the visitor struck this name three resounding blows, tried the latch, found the door unlocked, and flinging it wide, snatched off his hat and stared upon the man who, just risen from the elbow chair beside the blazing fire, stood staring back at him. And surely, surely neither Job the porter, nor Tom the bedmaker, nor any of his many clients would have recognised the worthy and estimable Mr John Jarvey in this grey-visaged, shaking wretch who wiped the sweat from furrowed brow with nerveless fingers and peered at the intruder in such wide-eyed, speechless terror. Aha! said the stranger, flinging off his sodden coat. Aha, John! Though twenty years are apt to change a man, I see you remember me. I have been buried, damn you, buried for nigh twenty years, John, while you, you that sent me to it, prospered and grew fat, curse you. But the grave has given up the dead, and I'm alive again, John. And a live man has appetites. I have many and raging. So here come I, John, freed from the hell you sent me to. I never did, Maurice, no, not I, never, never. So here I, here come I, John, hasting you wards to supply all I lack, my every need. For I mean to live, John, live on you, by you, with you. I mean to make up for all the wasted years. I have many needs, and every day these needs shall grow. Mr. Jarvey's deep-set eyes, usually so keen and steady, flickered oddly. His glance wandered, his hands fluttered vaguely. I... I am not a rich man. Indeed, no, Maurice. What would you have of me? All that you possess, and then more. Your money, your friends, your honour, your cursed self-complacency, your life, your very soul... My wants are infinite. If, said Mr. Jarvey, in the same strange, hesitant fashion, if you will be a little reasonable, Maurice, if you'd be a little reasonable, if you only would... Bah! cried the other, seating himself in Mr. Jarvey's cosy elbow chair and stretching his long legs to the blaze. Still the same snivelling coward... She called you coward twenty-odd years ago, and so she might again were she here and alive. But she's dead, John, dead and forgot by all save you and me. And, being dead, should her ghost haunt your chambers tonight and behold you with her spirit eyes, shivering and sweating where you stand, she'd name you coward again. From ashen white to burning red, from burning red to ashen white, and upon his pallid cheek a line of sweat that glittered in the candlelight. With hands clenched to sudden, quivering fists, and head bowed beneath between his shoulders, Mr. Jarvey stood and listened. But under drawn brows, his eyes, vague no longer, fixed themselves momentarily on the thin, aquiline face opposite. Eyes, these, bright with more than their wonted keenness, ere they were hidden beneath sudden, down-drooping lids. Her ghost? He mumbled indistinctly, his glance wandering again. Is she dead indeed? Years ago, John, and with bitter curses on your memory. Here's her ring. You'll remember it, I'm sure and the stranger showed a small, battered gold ring upon his little finger. 
Then, reaching out, he took up a glass that steamed aromatically on the hob. Aha! said he. What's here, John? My nightcap, Maurice, answered Mr. Jarvey, his roving gaze now upon the worn carpet beneath his slippered feet. Rum, hot water, sugar and a slice of lemon. I... I, I didn't know she was dead, Maurice. Ah, she's dead. And gone like your rum and water. Saying which, the speaker emptied the glass and set it down with a crash. Dead, murmured Mr. Jarvey, blinking down at the empty glass. Dead. Poor soul. Damned hypocrite, cried the intruder, rising so suddenly and with so wild a gesture that his foot struck the iron fender, dislodging the poker, and Mr. Jarvey, starting to the clatter of its fall, stood with bowed head, staring down where it lay gleaming in the firelight. Pah! exclaimed the other, viewing his immobile figure in pallid disgust. You were always a repulsive thing, Jarvey. How infinitely loathly you'll be when you're dead. Pray said Mr. Jarvey heavily, and without removing the fixity of his regard. Pray, when did she die? Tis no matter for you. Enough of it. I'm hungry. Feed me. And while I eat, I will tell you how I propose to make you the means of life to me henceforth. How you shall make up to me in some small measure for all those years of hell. You will blackmail me, Maurice? To your last farthing, John, to the uttermost drop of your blood. And if I seek the shelter of the law? You dare not, and tonight you shall sign a confession. And if I refuse, Maurice? This. Mr. Jarvey slowly raised his eyes to the pistol half-drawn from the breast of the threadbare coat. You would murder me then, Maurice. Joyfully, if need be. But now I'm hungry, and you keep a well-filled cupboard yonder, I'll warrant. Cupboard? murmured Mr. Jarvey. Cupboard? Well filled? Oh, aye, to be sure. And turning, he glanced at the wide cupboard that stood against the opposite wall, a solid and somewhat singular cupboard this, in that, at some dim period, it had been crowned with a deep cornice, the upper moulding of which had been wedged and firm fixed to the ceiling, and it was upon this upper part, that is to say, between the true top of the cupboard proper and the ceiling, that Mr. Jarvey's gaze was turned as he crossed the room, obedient to his visitor's command. Very soon he had set forth such edibles as he possessed, together with a bottle of wine, and, standing beside the hearth again, chin on breast, watched while his guest plied knife and fork. "'And you tell me, Maurice,' said he at last, speaking in the same hesitant manner, and with his gaze now upon the gleaming poker, "'you tell me that you... Would murder me? Aye, <laughs> I would, John, like the vermin you are. But you will be infinitely more useful to me alive. By means of you I shall feed full, lie soft, and enjoy such of life as remains for me to the uttermost. And I, said Mr. Jarvey, turning to stare up at the cupboard with a strange new interest, I must slave henceforth for your pleasure, Maurice? Precisely, John. An evil destiny, Maurice. And here Mr. Jarvey's glance, roving from his guest's lank form to the top of the cupboard, took on a keen and speculative intensity. Your sin hath found you out, John, and come home to roost. A youthful indiscretion, Maurice that killed a woman and sent a man to twenty years of hell. But that is past, John, and the present being now, you shall fill me another glass of your very excellent wine. 
Mr. Jarvey, having dutifully refilled the glass, took up his station by the hearth again, while his guest, holding up the wine to the light of the candles, nodded over it, smiling grimly. Twenty years of hell and degradation. A woman's life. Ha! John, I drink to you. Here's misery for you in life and damnation in death. The speaker nodded again and, sinking back luxuriously in the cushioned chair, raised his glass to his lips. Then, swift and sudden and very silent, Mr. Jarvey stooped and his twitching fingers closed tight upon that heavy, bepolished, gleaming poker. Chapter 2 Job, the night watchman, opening slumberous eyes, shivered and cursed, and, crouching above his fire, stirred it to a blaze, but, conscious of a chill breath, turned to behold the door of his lodge opening softly and slowly, wider and wider, until he might behold a dim figure standing without, a tall figure clad in a rain-sodden, many-caped riding coat and a shadowy, wide-eaved hat. Gate, ho, gate, said a hoarse voice, indistinct by reason of upturned collar and muffling shawl. Very slowly the unwilling Job arose, scowling, and stepped forth into a night of gusty wind and rain. Look ye now, my master, he growled, slowly drawing bolt and bar. We all respect due as for one as ain't a gentleman and don't want to be, to one as is or ought to be. What I means to say is, don't ye come no more of them jostlings, pushings, nor yet shovings, lest as twix a man and man I should be drawed to belt ye one for body-snatching thief and rogue, d'ye see? Hereupon the door swung wide, and with never a word or look, the tall figure flitted away into the driving rain, and was swallowed in the dark. Chapter 3 Come in, cried Mr Jarvey, sitting up in bed and straightening his nightcap. Come in, Tom, Lord bless me, Tom, what is it then? Come in. Obedient to this summons, the door opened to admit a shock of red hair with two round eyes below that rolled themselves in a gruesome manner, "'Lord love ye, Mr Jarvey, sir,' quoth Tom. "'Good morning to ye, I'm sure, but, Lord bless ye, "'and you layin' there sleeping so innocent as babes and lambs, "'and it a-moanin' and a-groanin' and carryin' on "'as do fair make me flesh creep, sir. "'I creep and likewise crawl.' "'Tom,' sighed Mr Jarvey gently, "'Tom, I fear you've been drinking. "'Never a blessed spot, sir.' So help me, Mr. Jarvey, sir, not one never so much as... Oh, Lord, there it be at it again. Do you hear it, sir, don't ye? Hark to it. So saying, Tom edged himself suddenly into the bedroom, but, with terror-stricken face, turned over his shoulder to peer into the chamber behind him as, dull and soft and low, there came a sound inarticulate and difficult to define a groaning murmur that seemed to swell upon the air and was gone again. Mr. Jarvey's hands were clenched upon the bedclothes, the tassel of his nightcap quivered strangely, but when he spoke his voice was clear and even, and full of ben benignant reproof. Tom, you are drunk without question. Not me, sir, no. Take me Bible oath on it, I will. Sober as an howl I be, sir. But you heard it a-groaning and a-moaning ghastly-like. You heard it, Mr. Jarvey, sir? Nonsense, Thomas. Heard what? Speak plain. It were a groogeous, gloopy noise, sir. Like a strangling cat or a dog in a... There! Oh, love me, there it is again, sir. Listen how it dithers like a phantom in a churchyard, like a... Tom's voice ended in a hoarse gasp, for somewhere in the air about them there seemed a vague stir and rustle, a scutter of faint movement, 
lost in a fitful, whining murmur. Tom was upon his knees, cowering against the bed, his head half buried in the counterpane. Thus Mr Jarvie's fingers, chancing to come upon his shock of hair, tweaked it sharply, albeit he sm spoke in the same benignantly indulgent tone. Tom, fool, you are a drunken fool and a fanciful fool. Have done rolling your eyes and go order my breakfast. A rasher of ham, Tom, and two eggs. Tell Mrs Valpy I found the coffee over weak yesterday and the ham cindery. Off with you, Tom, and bring my breakfast in half an hour. Obediently, Tom rose, and heartened by Mr Jarvie's urbane serenity, shook himself together, pulled a wisp of hair, made a leg, and hurried off on his comfortably commonplace errand. Left alone, Mr Jarvie sat up in bed, and tearing off his nightcap, sat twisting it in restless hands. Then, all at once, he was out of bed, and, creeping on naked feet, came where he might behold that cupboard. Very still he stood there, save for the restless hands of him that wrenched and twisted at his nightcap, while he stared up at a crack that ran along the cornice with eyes of dreadful expectancy. Suddenly, dropping the nightcap and setting both hands upon his ears, he backed away, but with his gaze fixed ever in the one direction, until, reaching his bedchamber, he clapped to the door and locked it. When, in due season, Tom returned with the breakfast, he found Mr Jarvie shaved and dressed, as serene and precise as usual, from the crisp curls of his trim wig to the buckles of his shoes. But as he ate his breakfast, the cupboard seemed to obtrude itself on his notice more and more, so that he took to watching it furtively, and seemed almost unwilling to glance otherwhere. Even when he sat giving Tom the usual precise directions for dinner, served always winter and summer at six o'clock, his look would go wandering in the one direction, so that it seemed to him at last that the keyholes of the two doors stared back at him like small, malevolent eyes. A steak, Tom. Yes, a steak with... Uh, yes, mushrooms and underdone, Thomas. And a pint of claret. Nay, burgundy, it is richer and more comforting. Tom, burgundy. Very good, sir, answered Tom, and now, even as the clock of St Clement Danes chimed the hour of nine, he tendered Mr Jarvie his hat and cane, according to immemorial custom. But, to Tom's gasping astonishment, Mr Jarvie waved them aside. Uh, not yet, Tom, not yet, said he. I've a letter to write. Uh, ah, yes, a letter, to be sure. The office shall wait, and... Ah, uh, Tom, I am thinking, yes, seriously considering, taking up smoking. What? You, Mr Jarvie, sir? Lord love me. Why not, Thomas? It is a very innocent vice, sure. Yeah, why, so it be, sir, and comforts a man astonishing. Uh, to be sure. Uh, now, what tobacco do you use, Tom? Cuban, sir. Is it? Uh, good, strong tobacco? Fairish, sir. What is a very strong tobacco, Tom? Why, there's black twist for one, sir. My grandmother smokes it in fair reeks, she do. Holy powers, she do so, sir. Black twist, Tom. Uh, to be sure, you may go, Thomas, and mind a steak underdone with mushrooms. When Tom had departed, Mr Jarvie, taking hat and cane, crossed to the door, but going thither, whirled suddenly about to look at the cupboard, and sinking into a chair, remained to stare at it until the two keyholes seemed to blink themselves at him, one after the other, whereupon he stirred and, shifting his gaze with an effort, rose to his feet, and, taking hat and cane, glanced once more at the cupboard, and began to retreat from it, walking backwards. Reaching the door, he leaned there and nodded his head. Black twist, said he, burned in the fire shovel. 
Then, groping behind him, he found and lifted the latch, and backing swiftly out, clapped to the door and hasted down the winding stair. Chapter 4 "'It were just a fortnight agone this here very night, Job,' exclaimed Tom, the bedmaker, spitting thoughtfully into the fire. "'And tonight be Christmas Eve, Tom. "'As ever was, Job, and twere just two weeks gone, agone, and mark that. "'And I know, because that very day I had new-painted the gate into Fetter Lane "'and some rascal had clomb over and smeared all the paint off. "'Consequently, I had to paint it over again. Two weeks tonight, Job, and Mr Jarvie never the same man since. "'Changed, he be. "'And... Uh, uh, and changing. How so, Tom? How so? Took to smoking, he have, for one thing, Job. Place fair reeks of it of a morning. Ah, oh, reeks to be the only word. Smokes, do he? Quoth Job, puffing at his own pipe. And wery proper in him, too. Tobacco's good for the innards, Tom. Comforts the bowels and mellows the system. True enough, Job. But tis mighty strange in Mr Jarvie. Him as could never abide the smell of a pipe all these years. And now to take to smoking? Ah, an uncommon strong tobacco too, judging by the smell of the place of a morning. Why, strong tobacco's the sweetest, Tom. Give me plenty of body in me beer and me backy, says I. Well, there's body enough in Mr Jarvie's. Lord, fair choked me it did this morning when I opened the door. Gamey it were. I never sniffed such tobacco in all my days. No, not even my grandmother's. And she reeks to holy heavens, she do. And then, Job, when I opened the door's mo door this morning with my key, there's Mr Jarvie hunched up in the armchair over the earth and the fire dead out. Lord love me, Mr Jarvie, I says, be ye sick, sir. Never better, Tom, says he. Only a little wakeful by reason of the rats. Rats, says I. I've never seen none hereabouts, I says. Why then, says he, you didn't happen to see one run out of the cupboard yonder, did ye, there? He shouts quick and sharp like, pointing with his finger. Down in the corner, don't you see it, Tom? Only this, sir, says I, and I picked up one of his very own slippers. Whereupon, Job, he lays back in his chair and laughs and laughs till I thought he'd choke hisself. A kind of laugh as makes your flesh creep. And wherefore must your flesh go a-creeping, Tom? Cos all the time he was laughing, his eyes was big and round and staring. Ah, nodded Job. That's rum, that is. Rum took too frequent as a way of making, as a way of making any man's eyes stick out. Ah, as round as gooseberries, me lad. And as for seeing things, rats is nothing. It's snakes as is serious, and pink toads and big airy worms as twists and wriggles ain't to be sneezed at nor treated disrespectful. But rats? What's rats? A rat ain't... What's that? exclaimed Tom, starting and glancing suddenly towards the door. What's what? demanded Job, starting also and scowling. I thought I heard something. Outside. That St Clement a striking. What you got to shake and shiver at St Clement for? I dunno, muttered Tom. I thought I heard footsteps outside, a creeping. How could ye be Joel's when there's six inches of snow outside, as you very well know? Look, Job, look, whispered Tom, starting up and letting fall his pipe to point with shaking finger. Look there, there! Following that shaking finger, Job espied a small, furtive shape that, flitting from the shadow of the door, scuttered across the room and was gone. A rat, he snorted. And then what? There's plenty about, as you very well... Look, the door, Job, look at the door! As he spoke, very slowly and stealthily the door was opening inch by inch, until suddenly it swung wide, 
and as if borne upon the buffeting wind and flurry of snow, a tall figure appeared, who, clapping to the door, leaned there and, peering thitherwards, they recognised Mr Jarvie. It came this way, I think, he questioned in a strange, high-pitched, querulous voice. I followed it a long time and it came in here. Suddenly this unknown, capitious voice gave place to boisterous laughter, and coming forward, Mr Jarvie hailed them in his own kindly, benignant, to benignant tones. <laughs> God bless us all, what a night! And still snowing, frosty and snowing, but seasonable, yes, very seasonable. A Merry Christmas to you both and a Happy New Year! This old inn hath seen a many Christmases and known a many New Years, and shall know a many more when we are dead and gone. Dead and gone, eh, Job? Why, sir, to die and go is nature after all. And so it is, Job. Death is the most natural thing. A good thing and kindly. The weary may hap find rest at last, and the eyes, aye, the eyes that watch us unseen, that blink upon us if we do but turn our back, those cruel, unsleeping eyes shall spy upon us no longer. Here is a joyous thought, and this should make death welcome. Tom, my good Thomas, have you chanced to notice the keyholes of my cupboard? cupboard? I cover them up sometimes, but they are always there. So saying, Mr Jarvie, having glanced over his shoulder towards the door, nodded and smiled in his kindly benevolent manner as he leaned forward to warm his hands at the fire, while Tom glanced from him to the fragments of his broken pipe on the hearth, and Job puffed thoughtfully. Suddenly upon the silence stole the soft, mellow chime of St Clement telling the hour. Ark to Clem, said Job, stirring uneasily as the last stroke died away. Ten o'clock already. Aye, sighed Mr Jarvie, his glance wandering to the door again. The hours of a man's life are numbered and quick in passing. I have heard St Clement's bells chiming my life away these many years, Job. Well, then, sir, with all respect do, axing your pardon, I says, dang St Clement's bells with all me heart. No, Job, no. Uh, they are like the voices of old friends. I would wish for none other sounds in my ears when I come to die. Lord, Mr Jarvie, sir, exclaimed Job, wriggling in his chair. Why talk of dying? And this Christmas heave too. And I'll be going, quoth Tom, rising suddenly. You'll be taking your breakfast an hour later than usual, according to custom, tomorrow being Christmas Day, Mr Jarvie, sir? He inquired. Why, uh, no, Tom, answered Miss... Excuse me, answered Mr Jarvie thoughtfully. Tomorrow being Christmas Day, you may take a holiday, Tom. But what about you, sir? Your breakfast? I shall be very well, Tom. Why, thank ye, Mr Jarvie, sir. I'm sure. Good night and a Merry Christmas to ye, exclaimed Tom, touching an eyebrow. Then, with the same good wishes to Job, he departed. For a while... There was silence, Job puffing at his pipe and Mr Jarvie leaning forward to warm his hands and stare into the fire. And, watching him as he sat thus, Job presently became aware of two things. Firstly, that Mr Jarvie's lips were moving soundlessly, and secondly, that ever and anon at sudden and frequent intervals he started and turned to glance swiftly towards the door very much as though someone standing there had spoken in reply to some soundless question. He did this so often that Job began to glance at the door also, and more than once thought he saw a small, dark shape that flitted amid the shadows. At last, his pipe being out, Job rubbed his chin, scratched his head, wriggled in his chair, and finally spoke. Excuse me, Mr Jarvie, sir, but what might you be a-watching of? Watching? 
repeated Mr Jarvie, hitching his chair a little nearer to Job's. No, no, it is I who am watched, Job. Wherever I go, sleeping and waking, night and day, which becomes a, a little distressing, Job. But who's a going to have the appearance to go a watching of you, Mr Jarvie, sir? Mr Jarvie leaned nearer to lay a hand upon Job's arm, turning to him, turning him so that he faced the shadowy corner by the door. I'll show you, Job. Look there. Following the direction of Mr Jarvie's pointing finger, Job thought once more to espy a small, vague shape crouched in this dark corner, a shape that leapt suddenly and scuttered along the grimy wainscot and was gone. "'By Jules!' exclaimed Job, scaring. "'It be that there rat again!' "'Why, yes,' nodded Mr Jarvie. "'It does look like a rat, but... "'And a rat it be, sir, only a rat.' "'And yet,' sighed Mr Jarvie, shaking his head, "'Who ever heard of a rat dogging a man through six inches of snow? "'Rats!' quoth Job sententiously. "'Rats is queer hanimals, sir, and uncommon audacious at times, "'but I never heard tell of a rat following a man through six inches of snow afore.' "'Why, you see, Job,' answered Mr Jarvie, gently shaking his head, I didn't say this was a rat. I merely remarked that it looked like one. But it grows late, Job, and rat or no, I must be going. So saying, he rose slowly and donned his greatcoat. But with his hand outstretched toward the door latch, he shivered and turned back to the fire as if unwilling to face the bleak night. The wind's rising, Job said he, shivering again and reaching his hands towards the fire. Hark to it, he whispered, as from somewhere without rose a shrill piping that sank to a wail, a sobbing moan, and was gone. A dismal sound, Job, dismal and ominous, yes, a very evil noise. And the chimney pot's loose on number five, said Job gloomily. For a while they sat listening to the wind that rumbled in the chimney and wailed mournfully, near and far, that filled the world outside with discordant clamour and passing left behind a bodeful silence. Suddenly Mr Jarvie was on his feet and, crossing to the door, paused there to glance back at the cosy hearth. A happy Christmas, Job, said he. A happy Christmas to you and all the world. And then he strode out into the howling night. He was met by a buffet of icy wind that stopped his breath, a whirl of driving snowflakes that blinded him, while the vague dimness of the inn about him echoed with chaotic din, shrieks and cries and shrill piping laughter that swelled to a bellowing roar as the rioting wind swept by. Taking advantage of a momentary lull, Mr Jarvie crossed the inn, ploughing through snow ankle-deep, yet paused suddenly more than once to stoop and peer, now this way, now that, as one who watched something small that leapt and wallowed in the snow. Reaching number ten, he stood a while gazing up the dark stair and listening until the pervading quiet was whelmed in the tumult of the wind and the rattle of lattice and casement. Then Mr Jarvie, fumbling in a dark corner, brought thence a candle end, the which he lighted at the dim lantern, and with this flickering before him began to ascend the winding stair. And ever, as Mr Jarvie mounted, his glance roved here and there, now searching the dimness before him and now the gloom behind. He reached his own stair at last, and, pausing at the foot to snuff his candle with unsteady fingers, he went slowly up and up until, 
all at once there broke from him a strangled cry and he stood to stare at the small grey shape of that which crouched glared down at him from the topmost stair the candle fell and was extinguished came a howling wind gust that roared beneath the eaves, that shook and buffeted at rattling windows, and then in the darkness within rose shriek on shriek that was not of the wind. A rush of feet, a clash of iron, the crash of heavy blows and rending of wooden panels. But outside, the wind, as if wrought to maddened frenzy, roared and shrieked in wild halloo, louder, wilder, till, spent at last, it sank to a doleful whine, a murmur, and was still. And upon this quiet was the stealthy sound of a closing door, the grind of key in lock, and the shooting of heavy bolts. Chapter 5 And you don't have no recollection at all of seeing him go out the gate, Job. Not me, Tom. Nary a glimpse of him. A glimpse of un since Christmas Eve. And there's his door fast locked, and me a knocking heavens and, and no answer. Nary a sound. Job, I don't like it. Maybe he's out of town, Tom. Not him. And then there's a curious thing about his door. What, Tom, what? Top panel be all cracked across. A new crack, Job. Why, then you can look through, said Crack. Tom. No, I ain't tall enough, but cracked and split it be. Come and see for yourself. Why, Tom, the wind brought down the chimney pot at number five the other night, but I never heard of wind splitting a door yet. Well, come and see, Job. With due deliberation, Job got into his coat, clapped on his hat, and accompanied Tom to the top chambers of number 10. Arrived on Mr. Jarvie's landing, he beheld the door fast shut, and sure enough, a great crack in one of the upper panels. With Tom's assistance, Job contrived to get his eye to the split in the panel and thus peer into the room, and doing so, gasped and shrank away, and slipping from Tom's hold, leaned against the wall as if to faint. What is it, Job? Lord love us, what? We we got to open the door, Tom. Aye, but why, Job? Why? We got to open the door. Come now, both together. Between them, they forced the door at last, and then, beholding what was beyond, cowered back, clasping each other as well they might. For there, sure enough, was Mr. Jarvie, dangling against the cupboard from a hook deep driven into the roof beam, while above his dead face, from the broken panelling above the cupboard, was something black and awful, shaped like the talons of a great bird, but upon one of the talons there still gleamed a small, plain gold ring. The end. Dun dun dun. I like that one. Because we're not entirely sure what happened. Did he hang himself? Um, I should have put a content warning for suicide at the beginning of that, but the problem with that is it would have spoiled it. So, apologies profusely. But like, this is the problem with these kind of stories. Is like, yes, I can say, like, yeah, sure, if stuff happens in the story. But if it's literally like, this is what happens at the very end and is kind of the the twist, I guess, sort of twist, then it's like, oh, I don't want to ruin the story. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed those two. Got some, got some murderous tales tonight. Um, something about this feels inexplicably like a Fry and Laurie sketch. I think that's just me, Sam. Um, soupy twist, yes. Uh, my internet didn't seem to, I didn't drop any frames there, so I guess it wasn't me. 
Um, never know how how to best deal to deal the best to deal with that information. Yeah, me neither. Um, and yes, if it was if it sounded like a Fry and Laurie sketch, I think I think that's just me. I think that's just the way I do voices. <laughs> I think I end up just yeah. <laughs> Can you tell I was influenced massively from by Fry and Laurie in terms of like comedy things, even though this was not a comedy. Um, but uh, yes, thank you ever so much, Speedy, if you're still still around, um, for raiding over. I hope you had a lovely stream. That's just my inner Fry and Laurie. I don't think it's an inner Fry and Laurie. It's a very much an outer Fry and Laurie. Um, yes, thank you very much, Speedy, for raiding over. I hope you had a lovely stream. Um, I think you were, were you playing Paleo, did I see? Um, I hope that was a nice chill time. And thank you very much for, for raiding over. Hope you are doing well. But yes, that is that is going to do us for tonight. Um, and in fact, for for me, for the next couple of weeks. So I hope I hope you're all you're all content with Sam for the next couple of weeks. <laughs> that felt mean to say. I didn't mean that. Everybody's content with Sam. Sam is great. Um, we all love Sam. Um, yeah. So I will. You're not content with fine. Everybody but Sam is content with Sam. Um, but uh yes i will i will not be streaming next week next wednesday i will not be streaming the wednesday after because i am not in the country um and yeah will will not be able to stream but you will have stuff from sam so uh this saturday he's planning to read some uh wartime poetry I think wilfred owen possibly so soon i don't know i'm just naming wartime poems poets um maybe kipling i think there was a kipling poem that he was thinking possibly reading but anyway some of that um and then i don't know what book um wilfred owen's world war one poet stravaganza that feels mildly disrespectful <laughs> to wilfred owen but you know um yes so you'll you'll get that on Saturday, and I've no idea what he's planning on reading as his novel from then on, because it is Sam's turn on is Sam's term on the long book. Um, so uh, so yes, but ooh, you're going to read some Hope Hodgson off that lovely. It's probably some Trilogy of the Abyss from William Hope Hodgson. Nice, nice and cheerful, because we do like William Hope Hodgson. Turns out, good writer. But. On that note, um, I will see who we've got to raid. Have we got Stephen? Yay, we've got Stephen. Ooh, Stephen's playing Jusson. Lovely. Right, I'm going to throw you over to Stephen, whom we all love. He's wonderful. Um, and, oh, Ho Hope Hodgson died during World War One too. Interesting, didn't know that. But um, thank you all very much for being here. You're all lovely people. Um, very much uh, appreciated um, and yeah I hope you all have a good rest of your weeks and a good two weeks and I shall see you after those two weeks um, I hope you enjoy and have a good time uh, in that time words, things Yeah, take care of yourselves and the people around you and just go be the excellent people that you are and I will see you in a couple of weeks Goodbye.